I'll start. Good afternoon, um, everyone. For those of you I have not had an opportunity to meet, my name is Arash Ashram, the director of the Cancer Rehabilitation and Survivorship Program here at Cedar Sonic Cancer. And you may be familiar with our wellness, resilience, and survivorship series. And this is a chance for us to try to connect with you, our community, and um, delve into topics and ideas that we believe are important and, and relate to wellness and survivorship um, in, a, in a holistic way. Um, today's topic is something that as a team we've been talking about internally and um, I'm just so excited to be able to um, uh, dive into this topic today. It's the topic of awe and the science of awe. Um, I could tell you on a, on a personal note, I, I just returned from a, a, a camping uh, kind of cabin trip from Redwood National Park. So it was, it was hard not to experience this incredible sense of awe when you were walking among these towering trees in this um, green, you know, beautiful space. But we're gonna really dive into the science and how we can bring this down to a hopefully more routine basis and learn about how I can potentially contribute to wellness and, and resilience. And um, there's no better person that I know of um, that we could have uh, brought to um, lead this discussion today. And I wanna thank uh, Dr. Jennifer Steller for joining. So good afternoon. Um, and I'm gonna introduce the panel and then Dr. Steller will take it away. So by way of introduction, I'm gonna start with Dr. Steller. She's currently an assistant professor in the psychology department at the University of Toronto. She received her PhD in social personality psychology from UC Berkeley. She currently is serving as the director of health emotions and altruism laboratory, also known as HEAL. And her work really investigates a group of emotions called self trans, tr transcend, excuse me, self transcendent emotions. So these are things like awe that we'll be talking about today, compassion, gratitude, et cetera that promote empathy and altruism towards others and encourage cooperation and cohesion within groups and enhance the health and well-being of the individual. So this, her work really speaks to the, many of the themes of the programs that we've been um, uh, working through together. So her work aims to answer a fundamental mental question about humans. How do we transcend our own self-focus to care about other people, groups, and society as a whole? So Dr. Stella, thank you so much um, for joining. I'm gonna give you the platform in just a moment. Um, first, I also want to uh, welcome uh, someone you know very well, Dr. Jeffrey Wertheimer, who is a board certified clinical neuropsychologist. And he also serves as associate director of physical medicine and rehabilitation. And he's also the chief of psychology and neuropsychology here at Cedar sinai um, I think many of our community already knows him from his leadership in the GRACE program, from the Emerging from the Hayes program. And um, we really have to thank uh, Dr. Wertheimer for um, finding Dr. Steller and, 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 and convincing her to come. So thank you so much and thank you for joining. Um, and I hope everyone knows Michael Sieverts. Um, uh, I met Michael, what, it's been, what, 12? He was one of the first people I met when I came to Cedar sinai um, he uh, is a brain tumor survivor, um, a Qigong expert, but I really view him as the ambassador for wellness and survivorship in our local Los Angeles community. He really has um, made it his effort to help people live as well as they can for as long as they can. And so we thought he'd be a, a perfect panelist. So thank you all. Um, and welcome. So again, uh, for, for those of you just joining, Dr. Steller is going to give a presentation on the science of awe. And then during the latter half, we're going to love to take your questions through the chat and, and we'll have a panel discussion. We'll hopefully, I know we'll have a good conversation. So on that note, again, Dr. Steller, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. All right, wonderful. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen here with everyone. Can someone just let me know that you can see my screen, but maybe not my yeah, notes? It's perfect. 
All right, great. So uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to have a chance to share some of my work, but also just some of the burgeoning work in this area on awe, which I think is a fascinating emotion that I'm hoping to tell you more about today. Uh, so, so I'll start with giving you a bit of a background on this emotion. I know many of you may have experienced it. For some of you, it may be sort of a, a foreign word, um, but hopefully you've had this experience yourselves. And then we'll talk about some of the cutting edge findings about how awe can help cultivate well-being, health, and resilience, among other positive outcomes. And lastly, we'll take a little bit of time. Hopefully, we can start a conversation uh, about how all might fit within your own life. So I did first want to start, though, with a bit of a revisiting to some of our canonical history in psychology. Um, and for those of you who've taken an introduction to psychology course, you may have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's probably one of the most famous models in psychology. It was uh, created by Abraham Maslow, who you can see over here pictured on the right, who was a psychologist working in the 1960s during the humanist movement. And he outlined what he called a hierarchy of needs that humans should fulfill in order to be happy and healthy. And so you can see this triangle here at the bottom, we have our basic physiological needs. We need food and water, sleep, um, safety, but also you know, building off that once we have physiological needs and safety met, we need to have love and belonging, esteem. And at the top of this triangle, he placed sort of in the coveted spot, self-actualization, which is this notion of trying to become the best version of yourself to fulfill all of your potential. And this is a very self-focused way of being happy and healthy. But what many of you may not be as familiar with is that actually in the last few years of his life, Maslow tried to revise his model. Um, and so although it never quite took off much to his frustration the way his original model did, he did in this newer model place um, at this top peak point in the triangle, what he called self-transcendence. And that's quite a departure from this notion of self-actualization of being, um, you know, reaching your full potential, but instead it's actually about focusing less on the self, maybe even letting go of the self and becoming part of something larger than the self. So this might be um, having a goal that will last past one's own life, like a legacy or being part of a group that makes you feel a sense of meaning or fighting for a cause that affects a large group or all of humanity and offers you a sense of purpose. And so at the top of this peak was, as I said, what he thought of as this notion of self-transcendence. And in psychology, we've thought a lot about what self-transcendence means. And we now have a, a set definition of it, although there's always a bit of debate which is this notion of transcending or rising above or beyond the self and relating to something greater than the self. And it typically has these three qualities. So when people feel as if they are having a moment of self-transcendence, we have what we think of as a diminished ego or feeling that the self is actually quite small and maybe less important. Um, we also see that people have a sense of what we call ego dissolution. So maybe they forget themselves entirely. And that ego, which typically guides our decisions, is actually diminished or even melts away entirely. Um, and lastly, people often report in these moments that they feel connected to something larger than themselves, as I've mentioned. So people become more concerned with the welfare of others, maybe larger moral and existential questions that face humanity or their group as a whole. And Viktor Frankl, who um, was a philosopher and colleague of Maslow's, further argued that self-transcendence was really the pinnacle of human existence. So he said that only to the extent that someone is living out this self-transcendence of human existence, is he truly human or does he become his true self? He becomes so not by concerning himself with his self-actualization, but by forgetting himself and giving himself overlooking himself and focusing outward. And so you might be wondering why am I going into this historical lesson uh, of self-transcendence? But the reason is that I agree with a famous contemporary of mine, a psychologist named Jonathan Haidt, 
who argued that awe is the emotion of self-transcendence. And philosophers and theologians and artists, they have known this for millennia, but psychologists have really just started to discover the power of this really important emotion. And like uh, many self-transcendent experiences, whether it be meditation or mystical experiences, feelings of flow, it seems that awe is an active ingredient in these experiences and maybe what helps us focus less on ourselves and more on others, thinking about our long-term values and connecting to other people. And it's perhaps through this emotion that we can build up meaning, well-being, resilience, um, and even physical health. And so that's been one of my interests in studying this emotion of awe is to really understand this active ingredient in what we think of as these key self-transcendent goals or experiences. So I don't want to get too far into discussing awe without defining it. Um, and there are different definitions, so I'm really just going to offer you mine here today. I am an affective scientist, which means I study emotions, and I think about awe as an emotion. And this is the definition I typically work with. So I think about awe as an emotion that occurs in response to maybe an object or a person with such extraordinary qualities that it really defies comprehension. Um, and, and this is just one of many ways to think about awe, um, but I think thinking of it as a momentary experience, uh, particularly an emotion, is really valuable and can give us some insights into what this experience might be like. I did want to also mention, though, that like other emotions, um, like gratitude, for example, we see that people differ on how much they are prone to experiencing this emotion. So you can also think about awe not just as an emotion, but also somewhat as a disposition. So some people are more prone to feeling this emotion. They have a greater tendency to experience it frequently and intensely in their lives than others. Just like you can have sort of a grateful disposition, you can have this more awe-prone disposition. So like I said, you can think about it as an emotion that we might experience in the moment, but also as a way people might differ. And you can ask yourselves, how awe-prone am I? How much do I experience this emotion in my daily life when I'm out in the world? Now, I've uh, mentioned that there, are, or I, I will talk about how there are many different kinds of contexts that can evoke this emotion of awe, but there are two qualities that across the many different experiences people have that they say makes them feel awe. There are two qualities that seem relatively essential or um, vital to this experience, and I want to explain those to you because I think they give insight into what the experience of awe is like. The first one is this perception that you have encountered something that's vast and grand. So you can see over here on the left, I have a picture. Um, it's funny you brought up the redwoods because this is a picture I took um, of the sequoia trees in Kings Canyon National Park. You might not be able to see, but the people at the very bottom are very tiny. Um, these are huge ancient trees and their sheer size creates a sense of awe, that vast grand size even also thinking about how ancient and old they are. Um, and so this sense of vastness and seeing something that's grand um, really falls beyond the scope of what you normally encounter. That's a key element of awe. And this can be physical, like I said, it can be large size, but it could also be large number, but it can also be figurative. So you might um, see somebody who you think has a lot of charisma, or you might have an idea or encounter an idea that's so complex that um, it, it's almost vast in, in how it changes your thinking. These are more figurative forms of vastness. So we think about it as both this physical or this more figurative sense, which will come into relief a little bit more when we talk about what kinds of experiences typically elicit awe. Now, the other component of awe, besides encountering something that you perceive as vast and grand, is the perception that you are seeing something that challenges your view of the world. It doesn't fit within the way that you normally see the world. You almost have to see the world differently to accommodate this new information. So that's why on the right, you'll see this sort of silly image here because people describe all experiences as mind blowing. They have to see the world in a very different and new way. It might be because they're seeing a sunset that is the most extraordinary sunset they've ever seen. And so they almost have to rethink what that category of beautiful sunsets is because this sunset they're seeing falls so far outside of that category. So these two components, 
this notion of vast and grand and this idea that you're seeing something that makes you rethink the world. It might even force you to revise your schemas and views of the world. These are the two components that we think of as sort of the cognitive basis of awe. But I also wanted to share with you what this experience feels like in the words of some of our own participants. Um, you, you may be wondering what kind of experiences, I've alluded to a few here and there, um, and some of you may think that awe experiences are or have to be exceedingly rare. But it turns out that that's not true. We've done many studies where we do daily diaries in which people record their emotions and their emotional experiences every day over the course of a week or two weeks. And it turns out that people do report feeling a fair amount of awe can be somewhere in you know, the range of an average of two times a week, making it slightly more common than you might be expecting. It's not something that people feel every day, but it's also you know, not something that you have to travel to um, you know, distant lands to experience. So here's two examples I wanted to read you from a, uh, one of our own studies of daily life among students in college. Um, and so I'll read both of these quotes to you. So today I learned that there is no distinct center to the universe, that the center of the universe could be in another dimension. I was in Wheeler Auditorium during my astronomy C10 lecture and that piece of information just blew my mind. It opens up so many possibilities for the realm of physics that I can't even fathom. As uh, I've mentioned, nature and sunsets are particularly good at eliciting awe. So another student wrote that my most awe-inducing moment was looking out my window during the sunset and seeing the Golden Gate Bridge surrounded by the sky that was a mixture of orange, yellow, and blue. It was really beautiful and I just stared at it for a couple of minutes. I felt really calm and relaxed and it was a good break from what I was doing. And you can already see some of the sort of psychological outcomes to feeling this emotion, right? In this case, feeling very calm and relaxed, maybe pulling you out of whatever you might have been doing otherwise. So there are lots of ways that people can feel awe. Hopefully you're starting to, as I've talked about this emotion a bit more, think about ways you feel it in your own life. Um, I'm listed here a couple or a few contexts that are particularly common. So nature is actually, um, unsurprisingly to many of you, maybe the most common way in which people experience awe, but also other people. So maybe it's seeing a charismatic figure that's giving a speech. Maybe it's going to a concert and seeing someone that you think of as you know, a celebrity or rock star, um, but it also could be someone just in your regular daily lives. So a lot of, uh, of our participants report that when um, they see their partner go through childbirth, they feel a sense of awe towards their partner and that experience of giving birth to a new life. So it doesn't have to just exclusively be out in nature or towards these non-social sort of situations, but it can occur actually almost around 50% of the time we get reports um, that it occurs in more of this interpersonal or social context. Um, art and music are uh, also common elicitors of awe. Same with religion and spirituality. And even as you could see from that first student I mentioned, ideas. So ideas that are novel and complex can make you see the world differently. And I just shared a couple of examples from my own life. Um, I tend to feel a lot of awe in nature. So on the right, this is a picture from when my partner and I traveled to Patagonia and saw some of the most amazing, awe-inspiring nature that I've seen in my life. But also on um, the left here, this is a picture of that I took walking home um, from work in Toronto of just like a spectacular, magnificent sunset that I hadn't really seen before. So like I said, it doesn't have to be these, um, you know, fantastic trips to exotic locations. You can feel awe in your daily life. Now, what's interesting about awe and what makes it self-transcendent is that it radically impacts how we see the self. And in particular, it reduces self-focus. So it pushes back against that notion that maybe we're the center of the universe, which we can all succumb to here and there, or um, even just reducing that sort of tendency to focus on ourselves, what we need and what we want. And I just wanted to quickly mention a couple studies that have found these kind of results. The first, which I've shown you just a couple pictures from, was a really interesting study done in the lab where I did my PhD by uh, researchers who took participants either to, or at least uh, measured um, their responses either outside of Yosemite or outside of another outdoor location that wasn't quite as beautiful as the park itself, but was nearby. 
And then they had participants draw themselves. And you can see here um, underneath the awe-inspiring site of Yosemite that on average people were drawing themselves as being sort of more small than people who are at these other control condition locations that were outside. So this is just one example, but it's a very robust finding when studying awe that people feel that they are small when they're encountering something that makes them feel awe. And at extreme levels or more extreme levels, this can lead to what we call ego disillusion, where people just forget entirely about themselves and the self just, which seems so important and which guides so many of our decisions just isn't that important. And so for instance, they've done linguistic studies of people who are recounting moments of awe. And what they find is after recounting these moments, they use fewer I words and more we words in their um, writing, which is sort of a, uh, a a way of getting around and trying to get to how salient the self is. And it suggests that that self is a little less salient, that that I is coming up a little bit less when people are writing about um, their awe experiences. Now, in addition, as I've already mentioned with self-transcendence, that work finds that awe makes people feel connected to others. So when the self melts away, those pretty solid boundaries that we draw between ourself and other people can also blur a little bit. And so studies have found that when people are recounting moments of awe, that they actually describe um, themselves and their identity or the self as overlapping more with the rest of humanity, this sense of common humanity. And in addition, in another set of studies, people found that when they had to describe them or researchers found when they had, people had to describe themselves, you know, they typically use words like, I am funny, I am a mother. Um, but when they had to describe themselves after all experiences, they were more likely to use what we call superordinate categories. Like I am a person, I am a human. So these really large referential categories that classify us not by our traits or our roles, um, or even by our group membership, but by the sense of being a human, being one of a web of interconnected humankind. And so these features of awe, this impact on the self, are really what make awe a self-transcendent emotion. And it's the effect that it has on the self that I think explains some of the, the effects that we'll see for mental and physical health. And so that's what I want to spend a bit more time talking about now. Um, so hopefully you know a little bit more about what this emotion is like, although feel free to ask me more questions about the awe experience um, later and after the talk. But I want to talk about, yeah, why this self-transcendent emotion is important for health and well-being and resilience. Now, there's been a lot of new research on awe, and this research is finding that it promotes all sorts of positive outcomes. So we're finding that awe can cultivate other traits that we value or virtues. So it increases humility, it uh, increases curiosity, um, and it also seems to focus our attention outward and strengthen, as I said, our connection to others. So it leads to things like greater generosity or helping behavior like donating, as well as um, perspective taking and potentially empathy for others. And so for even these reasons alone, it's important to consider how all might be a factor in your own life and promoting these sort of virtuous and social outcomes in your own life. But I wanna focus, given our interest today, a little bit more on its impact on health and well-being and resilience. So I'll quickly summarize a few of the studies in this area to give you a better sense of what I mean when I say that awe seems to have an impact on these outcomes. So how might awe relate to physical health? Well, physical health is a very big category of outcomes. Um, so we'll only focus on one today. Um, and so I've got a picture here for you on the left, you'll see this sort of strange um, red squiggly lines. And this is a protein um, called pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is just one version of them. And the name may sound a bit intimidating for those of you who haven't heard of these before, but they um, are basically little proteins that promote inflammation in the body. That's all you really need to know. And they can give rise to acute symptoms like fever and fatigue and even pain, which you can see um, pictured here on the right. But, uh, and so they're part of the body's, you know, normal mobilization response to an acute problem like illness or injury or infection. But 
The problem is that over time in some people, these pro-inflammatory cytokines become what we see is chronically elevated. And this can promote chronic levels of inflammation that um, aren't helpful. In fact, they're harmful for health. And past work has found that elevated chronic levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines can contribute to diabetes and cardiovascular disease and depression. So essentially, once you are no longer ill, if you're a healthy individual, you don't have an injury or infection, you really don't want to have high levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines just hanging out and circulating in your body. They can be damaging. And so our lab was interested in understanding potentially the relationship between positive emotions like awe and levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines in the body. And we were interested in understanding whether positive emotions like awe might be associated with lower levels of this damaging biomarker. And past work has found that some negative emotions are associated with greater levels. So it's not too uh, much of a stretch to assume that some positive emotions might be associated with lower levels of this, this damaging biomarker. And so we had people or a healthy group of undergraduates fill out a survey about how much they experienced different positive emotions, including awe in the past month. Then we collected a saliva sample and measured their levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. And what we found was that this um, emotion of awe more than any other positive emotion was associated with lower levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines in this healthy sample where, again, you would want to see low levels. And so what this suggests at a very early stage is that there may be an interesting relationship that we need to understand better between awe and levels of inflammation through these pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so we're following up on this work. I've been collaborating with the Royal Ontario Museum um, because art, as you know, is a very um, strong elicitor of awe. And there's a couple exhibits in the museum right now that are very awe-inspiring. And we're actually trying to bring participants into the museum and see if we can see marked decreases in levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines after these awe-inspiring experiences in the museum compared to say other experiences like walking around the basement of our psychology building, which I can assure you is not awe-inspiring. Um, and, and the goal of, is trying to understand whether we can reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines, this sort of causal relationship, establishing this relationship between feelings of awe and lowering levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So stay tuned, we're still collecting that data. But our hope is that not only can we highlight the importance of awe, but also the importance of these kinds of spaces, art spaces, nature spaces, um, concert spaces for physical health, not just as a place where we can go and see something beautiful, but as something that can actually be important for promoting physical health and, and mental health, which is a good segue into thinking about how awe might relate to well-being. There are a lot of ways that you can measure well-being. Um, one very common way that I'll talk about today is something we call life satisfaction. So just simply how satisfied are you with your life at the current moment? And we wanted to know how all might relate to that measure of well-being. And so in one of our studies, we followed students over their first year of college, which you may remember is a notoriously trying time. Um, it's exciting, but also a lot of adjustments, a lot of stress. And we asked them to report on a variety of emotions, including awe, as well as life satisfaction. And then we followed them up at the end of their first year. We also had them take part in a daily diary study, which I mentioned, where we follow them day and they have, have them fill out a survey for uh, two weeks every night. And what we found in the study is that feeling all predicted greater life satisfaction over the course of the year actually increases from the beginning to the end of the year and over a shorter two week period. So on days when people reported having an awe experience, those were the days they also reported the higher, highest levels of satisfaction with life. And this isn't just an effect of positive emotions generally, we've taken great pain to control for other positive emotions. And we've identified that there is a unique relationship between awe and life satisfaction. Not to say that other positive emotions aren't important, they certainly are, but just that there is a unique benefit um, its own independent benefit of feeling awe for things like life satisfaction. And um, future research is really interested also in building up other elements of well being, like how awe might contribute to greater purpose and meaning, which I've alluded to earlier. Now, awe uh, also seems to be related to resilience and may be able to help encourage resilience, especially for individuals 
who've uh, encountered trauma. So uh, from my PhD lab, a group of researchers has been doing really amazing work with veterans and also underprivileged youth, both groups of which who face trauma in their lives. And the idea is that they uh, take these individuals out into nature. And they've done this by partnering with the Sierra Nevada Club, the Cal Veterans Group and Inspiring Connections Outdoors to go on trips to the Sierra Nevadas. And I've got some pictures here of what happens on these trips. So these are two day long trips and they include things like river rafting, camping. Obviously the goal is to be out in nature. Um, and the idea is to document, and this is what the researchers have done, reports of things like post-traumatic stress disorder, symptomatology, stress, well-being in these two groups, veterans and underprivileged youth when they've been bringing them out into the Sierra Nevadas. And what they found is that feeling awe leads to reduced PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder symptomatology and to greater well-being in these vulnerable populations. So this work has really inspired a larger dialogue about what mental health can be and whether things like subsidizing, you know, hiking boots and, you know, bus trips out into the Sierra Nevadas might be something that's important for companies who are interested, insurance companies, in promoting mental and physical health, something that they should be subsidizing and investing in, not just to fix problems when they occur, but also to prevent um, problems from occurring in the first place by cultivating physical and mental health. And so it's starting to sort of be part of a larger conversation and dialogue about how to think about a more holistic sense of well-being and health. And I'm glad that this science-based um, evidence can be used in that conversation. So these are just a few of the many studies. There are really amazing findings coming out on the relationship uh, or benefits of awe for things like depression as well and resilience to um, you know, re-experiencing depressive episodes that I won't have time to talk about today, but it does seem like this emotion that we know very little about at this point, um, and is really new to the scene as emotions go, um, might have these really important and powerful effects for thinking about health and well-being and resilience. And so hopefully today we can think a little bit more about how awe might relate to your life. And as someone who is not a survivor of cancer myself, I can at least say how it's been important in my life and hopefully you all can think about how it relates to your own lives and maybe we can share a bit of that um, in the last part of the, the discussion today. So as I said, these are sort of my personal takeaways for how I think um, awe could fit into your life, how it's fit into my own. Um, the first is going back to this notion of self-transcendence. Um, and so, you know, it's very tempting when we're trying to pursue our own health and well-being, our mental and physical health, to focus on the self. And there isn't necessarily anything wrong with that, right? Building self-esteem, promoting self-worth, um, working on self-control, these very self-focused goals. There's nothing wrong with that. But what I'd like to argue is that there might be an alternative or additional path which is instead of focusing on the self to perhaps look past the self and focus on other people, on the greater world around you, maybe what other people need, um, but also what the world needs. Um, and there's great work suggesting that when people feel awe, they start to want to engage with these sort of larger collective concerns, like maybe how can we combat climate change? Um, what can I do in my local neighborhood to make this neighborhood better? Um, and through these experiences, through moving past ourselves, we may be able to, you know, improve our own well-being and health in sort of this ironic twist by losing the self, we can, can find a healthier version of ourselves. So my first piece of data-driven advice would be to try when possible to look beyond the self. In addition, um, I encounter this notion that the kinds of experiences that elicit awe they seem to be the kinds of experiences that people think of as luxuries. So this could be something like traveling. This could be something like going to a concert, which I've pictured here, going um, even on a walk, right? When you're really busy at work, feels like a luxury to take 15, 20 minutes to go just for a walk outside. But I think what I'm hoping I can instill in you by introducing you to the notion of awe and its potential benefits today is this idea that awe isn't a luxury, that it's actually important for our health and well being. And, you know, we all try to make space to avoid emotions we don't like, 
like sadness and shame and anger. But I would say that it's as important um, to think about ways to cultivate our positive emotions. And that's been one of my goals as a researcher, whether it be awe or compassion or gratitude, um, these emotions in particular are important for binding us to other people, to the world, to feeling connected. And so we, we need to think of them not as just these little luxuries or things that we get to do if we finish all of our work, but actually as, you know, build these into our routines, our days, build in these kind of moments. Um, and, and even if it's hard for you to get outside, you know, the internet um, may be surprising to you, but the two emotions that spread the most on the internet are, I'm sure you wouldn't be surprised with this one, anger, but the other one is awe. And so, you know, if you get those links from friends about beautiful places you should travel or the prettiest things or, you know, um, planet earth videos, whatever it is, amazing feats from other people, those can be ways to feel awe without necessarily having to get up and find nature um, or go to a concert or something like that. So, so building those moments into your routine, however you do that is I think an uh, important lesson for all of us. And lastly, um, finding awe in the everyday. I mentioned this earlier that um, certain people are more prone to feeling awe. It's, it's not because there's necessarily anything special about them. In fact, what seems to predict people who are more awe prone is openness. And what I think that is signaling to us is that these are individuals who get out in the world. They put themselves in situations where they can feel awe. Maybe they go to a concert, maybe they take that walk um, and you can see a picture here. This is from one of the walks that I have gone on in the fall in Toronto, which is a beautiful place to be in the fall because we have a lot of maple trees and um, they turn red and yellow and all the shades in between. And so going out and putting yourself in situations in your daily life where you can feel awe, that's really the key to promoting this experience. Because once you're in an awe-inspiring experience, you don't usually have to work very hard. It kind of hits you over the head. But what you do have to do is put yourself in that experience. And so I want to stress, as I've said earlier, that you don't have to travel to these really far places or contemplate, you know, the most important questions in life. You can have these experiences in your everyday life. And I, I wanted to end on this example that um, really has stuck with me from one of our daily experience studies where someone wrote about... Um, feeling off from their coffee, which if for those of you who are coffee drinkers like myself, um, you probably just, you drink it for the caffeine, but you're not really paying attention. And what this person spent a paragraph or two writing about was how beautiful it was when they poured the cream into their coffee and they could see it swirling around and making this almost like artistic, um, yeah, view for them as they were just trying to, to get their caffeine in the morning. And, and I thought to myself, well, that's the kind of person that sees all in the everyday, right? We might just quickly move past it, but they're actually taking the time to look around, to savor. And once they see that, they can, you know, that, that beauty, then the awe sort of comes more naturally. So making sure that you're finding ways to um, think about awe in, you know, your daily lives. And I think that's what I would sort of end by challenging all of you to do is how can you put yourself out in the world to experience this emotion, whatever that might be for you, if it's music, if it's nature, how can you get out there and, and have these awe experiences? Because they can be really important for not only your health, but um, but your well-being and resilience as well. Okay, so um, that's mostly what I had for you today, although I'm happy to have a discussion. We've got some time so we can chat about um, whatever it is that's meaningful to you all. I just wanted to finish by thanking you for listening to me. I know everyone's busy these days, so taking time out of your day to learn about the emotion of awe. Um, and my collaborators and other researchers who are doing really wonderful work in this area. So. I think at this point I can turn it back over to um, our hosts here and I will try and stop sharing my screen. Let's see if I can, always easier said than done, Let's see if I can do it here. Dr. Stella, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Feel free um, to jump in while I'm trying to figure out how to do this. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll figure that out. Thank you so much. It, it's it, it's yeah. um, especially relevant, I think, these topics to our community and, and to these times. Um, so as Lisette kind of mentioned in the chat, please, please feel free to put in any comments or questions 
um, for Dr. Steller or the panel. But while we're waiting, um, maybe I can. So I think there there should be a stop share. Yeah, I was. Um, I, oh, here it is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you think I would be better at this from having done it so many times from teaching, but there we uh, go. I think it's the. Did it stop? I someone else might have done that. So okay, thank you. I think I somebody stopped it. <laughs> Um, so I'll 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 look I'll be looking at the the Q and A, but if I could um, maybe just start. Um, you you mentioned sure. the study with the veterans, for example, yeah. and maybe experiencing PTSD symptoms and offering an experience. Are you aware of any research? Because as you may be aware, a subset of our cancer patients and survivors experience PTSD-like symptoms. Any research you're aware of of utilizing these kinds of programs and interventions specifically for our community? No, but I think that would be wonderful research to do. Um, and there's no reason to think that, that the benefits of all wouldn't translate over, but of course we would need to do research to, to demonstrate that that is the case. Um, but no, I don't know. And even that that study is one of just a few that's really tried to move the research on all into mental health. Um, mostly it's focused on well-being, being that it's a positive emotion. We're just starting to see some work coming out on things like depression and as a yeah, PTSD, but through this population of veterans and underprivileged youth. So I'm hoping we'll see see more of that, but but it is um, something we we don't have yet. In, in working with the Royal Ontario Museum, we've, we've also started um, a project that's part of, I'm not sure if you've heard this word, the social prescription program. So this is part of this larger conversation I've been talking about where we're trying to, to talk about more holistic forms of health. And so the Royal Ontario Museum is partnered with doctors and hospitals in the Toronto area so that doctors can write prescriptions to go see the Royal Ontario Museum for free. So especially for people, you know, who can't afford the ticket price, um, that's a really big benefit. So not only do you get to go, but you get to bring your family. They give you four tickets. And so doctors are writing these prescriptions. Prescriptions is, is the term we're using for them. But for um, people who have all sorts of physical and, and um, mental concerns. And so what we've been doing with them is trying to work on a large scale to document who they're writing the prescriptions for and to follow these individuals across four different waves to see if they're actually being helped by these prescriptions. And this is a very heterogeneous group, but my guess is that uh, cancer patients will be a subset of that group. So our goal has been to get as many participants as possible that we can look within subsets to see if there are particularly strong benefits for certain groups. Maybe it's people who have depression, maybe it's people who have um, battled cancer. And so that that may be something that that our research can speak to, but it's a it requires a very large sample. Um, and and part of what we're trying to see is who who doctors are choosing to write these kind of prescriptions for. So yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I hope we'll have more to share in the next sort of iteration of research. Maybe we could talk offline later about that. So um, yeah. I'm gonna bring up another question uh, for the chat. Well, one, one comment I just wanna to read to you right off the bat. Um, one person wrote, would it be silly to say that Dr. Steller's um, talk is awe-inspiring? <laughs> talk. That's um, very sweet. And you know, I use that word all the time. Once you start talking about it, I'm like, that's awesome. And I'm like, oh, I keep saying that word. But once you get into the mindset of awe, that's easy to, to think. So yes, I have. I appreciate the sentiment and yes, awe is a word that I have to hold back from using myself when describing things in general. Another person, um, one of our colleagues, um, basically is asking about the role of psychedelics. So mm -hmm. in, in, in trying to therapeutically promote, promote the awe experience. So um, what would you tell an individual? Should they go to the Redwoods or, or take, take um, one of these psychedelic drugs? Well, I think there is a connection um, personally between psychedelics and awe experiences. I've um, I've met with a number of people who are doing research on psychedelics, and they are convinced that awe is really the emotion that people are experiencing um, when they're having these these sort of almost mystical experiences during um, the use of psychedelics. And this is like you know in these very rigorously controlled 
studies in which they're actually giving participants psychedelics and monitoring them. Um, and they're seeing a lot of these self-transcending qualities of finding a sense of meaning, feeling very connected to others, and really in particular, this ego dissolution. So feeling like the self sort of melts away. And for many people that can be a self that's very like ruminatory and depressive. And so getting a little break from that voice in your head can be really cathartic and therapeutic. So if you have access and can safely engage with psychedelics and that works for you, I think to each his own. Um, but I do think the the research on psychedelics and awe is starting to link together. And that's really what's fascinating about this emotion. It it does seem to be this active ingredient in nature, in art, in religion, and spirituality, in psychedelics. And so that's, for me, part of what makes it so fascinating is it unites many of these self-transcendent experiences that I think are really meaningful for people. And that includes, I would say, the use of, of psychedelics. Um, and, and I think we'll start to see those connections tightening um, in the next, like I said, iteration of research. Thank you. Um... Dr. Wertheimer, Michael, any any comments or questions before I go to we'll go back to the chat? Michael, you want to take the lead? I've got a couple. But after you, Michael. Uh, yeah, no, this is this is wonderful. But um, you know, as a you know, in one of your other talks, you mentioned this is sort of being little earthquakes, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, a cancer diagnosis is a little earthquake and you know it is uh and it's it sort of seems like it's, a, it's an opening uh to you know dive into this idea but uh i also you know because i do this uh really really slow practice daily you know that that there's a lot one can do to uh make what what's desirable in your life easy mm -hmm. you know and you know I me mean, you know, it's not necessarily possible to uh, experience awe on a tight timetable. You have to really make a space for it in your life. And, and but, you know, this is, you know, it's wonderful. Great. Yeah, and, and I would say any, any way you can make space for that, whether it's sort of meditating in your own home or going out um, for a walk, that's, that's what I would say is my biggest point is encouraging people to make those spaces because they're, for me, at least they're the first things that get cut, right? They, they feel like, okay, before I cut my work time or there's other obligations I might have, I'm going to cut the quote unquote fun stuff. And I think it turns out to me that this fun stuff is actually not just superficially fun. It can be really meaningful and important for your health and well-being. And so I hope that we can see things from that perspective, because I think that will help us sort of through the marathon of life with, the, you know, these ups and downs and earthquakes, we need those moments built in. Um, and so, yeah, fighting against that notion that that's the first thing to get cut would be, be a goal. And sounds like you're making space for that, which is wonderful. Yeah, I'm lucky. I'm lucky I get to do it. No, it's, uh, and it is, and it sort of seems like it comes out of uh, you know, that if you were going to design something to destroy awe and you would hire a bunch of psychologists and engineers, you would come up with this. <laughs> and, uh, and, and people who, who are focused on grabbing your attention and just holding on to it to sell ads. Yeah. It, it's a, there it is. You know, so. well, I'm not a big social media user myself. I'm like one of the only people that doesn't have a Twitter handle, which I often get asked for when I give talks. And I'm like, I, I don't have one because for me, Twitter isn't a healthy space for my emotions. And so I think part you. of it is knowing how you engage and maybe it can be for some, but if it isn't for you, that is another whole aspect of, you know, something else has to be cut to make space for the awe. And yeah, for me, that has been social media to some, to some extent. I, I agree. So, Social media can be an amazing place for viral awe-inspiring experiences. So that's why it is a bit how one engages with it. I, for some reason, can't find a way to do it that's super healthy. So I just have to opt out. But if you're someone who can share the beauty of what's out in the world with other people and you can receive that, then the internet can be a lovely place. I think that was actually what people envisioned the internet was going to be before it became this version of it. 
Um, but there is the space for that. If we can figure out as humans how to do that, that would be that would be useful for the new metaverse to work on. Um, I think that would be an algorithm I would be excited to to have, which is one that finds awe inspiring things for me to look at on the internet. Well, Zoom has been amazing. It takes a little imagination, but even the you can conquer the asynchronicity of it. So, Jeff, for sure. Thank you. Great questions, Michael. Uh, Dr. Stellar, seize a moment. Thank you as well for this great, great presentation, a very important one. A big takeaway for me is the power of the awe experience being really a catalyst for living the present moment. So this is going to lead to the question I'm going to throw your way relates to kind of Maslow's hierarchy you mentioned, but I'll put a little pretext to it because you and I both share, and I think Dr. Asher as well, an affection for Frankel's work. Mm -hmm. where he highlights the, the friend and foe of memories or past and the foe of future-oriented thinking, where he says, if we always focus on the past to help cope with the present, it robs us from the experience of really spiritually and uh, growing from the current moment. Mm -hmm. But I, I highlight this in the context of, in our medical community, such as the one we're, we're speaking to today, the past is so important and the future is so daunting for some. Mm -hmm. And I want to tie this concept you brought with Maslow's hierarchy, when we're stuck in the physiological health and the safety health, and we feel like suffering is so dominant, how does one carve out that space, the cognitive yeah. space you mentioned to live the now in an awe moment? And I'll tie it to this one big point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Transcendence and even that self-actualization, it's not about getting to the top. It can be integrated into the now despite the suffering. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's such an insightful point. And that is, you know, I, I talk about Maslow's model. It is an incredibly influential model, but I don't by all means think that it's perfect, right? And I think what you're highlighting is one of maybe the weaknesses of the model, which is that it sort of insinuates that you have to wait to work on the, the stuff at the top until the bottom has been stated. And I think to some degree, it is certainly harder, right? If you, you know, if you're not getting food, um, that you need and you're starving, it's a bit harder to focus or a lot harder to focus on something like self transcendence, right? So to some extent there, there's, there's some truth there, but I also think that it shouldn't prevent us from trying despite it being difficult, right? So, so I think, you know, if you are in a space where you don't feel safe, um, or you're thinking about your future and it's daunting, understandably, that doesn't, um, or at least I would hope it shouldn't preclude you. It certainly makes it harder from trying to do things like reach your full potential and transcend and connect to others. Um, so I think I think that is one of the weaknesses of the model. Is it, it we don't I don't think we should wait to work on things at the top until all the bottom things are perfectly set and straight. Um, I think we you know these are just almost a, it's almost like the things that, you know, make it a little bit harder are going to reside at the bottom for you to get to the top. So if you, you are struggling with some of these more basic issues, it's going to be, yeah, the self-transcending component is going to be harder, but I would still advocate that you try. And I think it might be in those moments that you get the most benefit, right? Because um, you, you do have other struggles and stressors. And that's when we typically see awe can be really beneficial is in the context of this sort of negative space and sort of releasing individuals, even if it's just temporarily from that negative space. So depression is a good example where people talk about it as, you know, inducing awe just opens the door a little bit for you to get away from that sort of ruminatory self-focus that is a characteristic of depression to then work on other, you know, to be open to other interventions and, and working on, um, you know, being better um, and healthier. And so I think you, I could say the same, if you're, you're battling with cancer and your future feels daunting and your past feels like it's been a struggle, then, then that, that might make you somebody who would actually be acutely benefited by feeling awe. So I think that's a great question. And, and awe and savoring, which you also brought up, have been linked together. So mm -hmm. this notion of like, you know, I always feel when I have awe experiences that it, it pulls me out of my daily stressors um, and gives me just this zoomed out perspective. So I often use that term of zooming out and this abstract view of the world. It like pulls me outside of myself. And for me, that's helpful because I look down and I'm like, okay, this thing that felt all consuming at this moment, I can actually get a little break from it and see from a larger perspective. And it, it sort of liberates me a little bit. Um, and, you know, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be that way for everyone, but I do think there is that element of it that lets you just be in the moment without 
feeling like you're pulled towards the past or future too strongly. You know, we don't want to not do that at all, but, but sometimes we can go too far in either direction, which I think is what you're suggesting Frankel kind of was bringing up. And just to quickly comment to create more space yeah. and time, but what I want to underscore what you just said is importantly, they're not mutually exclusive. And two, when you kept emphasizing the trying part, it comes back to some of our program, you can deliberately and intentionally create this and it's, mm -hmm. it can be manufactured through effort. If this doesn't come to you, it can, but you can also right. create it. So thank you. I appreciate that really, yeah. really key point of making Yeah, that no, those are great points. Thank you. Dr. Steller, um, a general question. So do you, do you believe that um, individuals who are either more religious or more spiritual, um, does the science show that they experience uh, more routinely? In the context of religion and spirituality, yes. But, in, general, um, people, in general. Well, yeah. So I would say in general, no. Um, people who, uh, there are lots of ways to feel awe. And that's one of the, the things I learned in studying this emotion. So yes, people who are religious and spiritual, that's a place where they are going to experience more awe than people who aren't. But people who aren't may find it in other things, in music, um, maybe even in science um, and ideas. So I think it's about where you find that awe. Um, and if religion and spirituality is that space for you, then that's wonderful um, because you've identified a space that you know you can go to and have that really meaningful connection and experience. Um, but I wouldn't say that it necessarily means you have it more than, than someone else. It just means you've been you know, fortunate enough to find a space where you know you can go and have that, that experience. Um, other people may not have quite found that space space yet, but but many have, um, and just in different contexts. Along those lines, um, a, a number of individuals in the panel asked about you know, just thinking through what other barriers might be to experiencing awe, and, and I know you alluded to some of them, but um, yeah. maybe we could just crystallize that so that if it's something sure. somebody wants to think about, that we can try to move forward in the space. For sure. And, and I think we, you know, in this panel, we were just talking about, you know, stress and going through stressors that to me seems like one of those experiences. Stress can really focus us very much in on ourselves or very narrowly. And that's understandable given what we're facing. Right. Um, but it can also make it harder for us to engage with those on inspiring moments so we can we can miss them same with the phone right like having our head down in our phone walking by i've seen this so many times walking past a beautiful sunset and you're just sort of trying to update your status on your twitter account or your instagram account about something earlier in the day and you're missing this experience so so i think you know anything that promotes self focus can actually kind of pull us away from those awe experiences whether it's stress whether it's social media um, and then, you know, really it's, I would say, otherwise it seems that it's not as complicated as, as you might think it has to be. It's really just getting yourself out into those, out in the world, out in those experiences. And generally we find like, you know, if people are going to Yosemite, even if it's kids being dragged along by their parents and they didn't really want to be there, once they can engage with it and they look up away from their cell phone, then we don't have to do very much work. It really does seem like it's something people experience. So that's why I would say the first and most important step is just getting yourself there. And so if you're somebody who doesn't build those experiences in, you know, I've talked about a few, nature, the, the common ones, right? Nature, religion, spirituality, art, music. If you're not someone who gets yourself into any of those spaces, that would be what I would say is to, to advocate for getting yourself out there and then let then let yourself be there in the moment and the awe will do the rest usually um, has been my experience with participants. Thank you so much. Um, I'm being mindful of the time. There's a sure. number of comments just thanking um, oh. you for raising awareness of this topic and, and, and kind of um, sharing some of the science. I'm incredibly grateful. Um, for you taking the time. Um, I hope it's okay. I'm sharing, you know, you're, you're taking time out from maternity leave to be with us. Oh yeah, sure. I have my little baby downstairs with my partner right now. I have not heard any crying, so that's a good sign. <laughs> so we want to be respectful to your time. I hope we can um, cross paths again in the future. I want to thank Michael, Dr. Wertheimer. Thank you all. Um, Lisette is in the background. She, you know, she's done a lot of work um, administratively to make these seminars happen. 
Um, so Lisette, if you're there, thank you very much. We hope to see you um, for our next seminar series. And Michael, I see your hand, so a final word. Well, yeah, and I just saw someone uh, bring up this, that uh, when we're in the cancer space, that one of the most frequent ways I, I, I feel awe is in the presence of people who are really close to the end of their life. And sometimes this phenomenal grace comes out and it's just, it's there all the time and we just don't see it. That's it for me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was lovely to get to share some of my work and, and others in this area with you all. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for joining. Hope you have a wonderful afternoon.